Okay, guys, um, let's start with this session. Uh, my name is Roberto Castillo. I'm an assistant professor at the Cultural Studies Department here in Lingnan University. And I am very happy to be moderating this panel in which we will have, um, we will have the presence of um, Adrián Carrasco Sanini Molina from uh, Mexico. So I'm going to keep the introduction very short. They're going to be talking about their work and their lives when, when they speak. Then after that, we will have Eduardo Francisco Freire Roach coming from Cuba also to uh, speak. And after that, we will uh, have Ana Maria Saldana coming from Portugal, Brazil, and Macau. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Adrian Sanini to, he's going to show, he's going to play a film, a five minutes film. So Yesterday was very, very 
important for me to hear uh, everything we talked about revolutions and I wanted to start just by saying that I'm making this movie about Afro-Mexicans and they represent 1% of Mexican total population. And for the first time they're going to be on the census, the coming census in 2020. 2020. And uh, before that they were never counted in Mexico. So, uh, in, in my film, I'm going to start with the story. The, the movie is about the contributions of uh, the economic and social and cultural contributions of the Afro, Afro descendant people in Mexico. And I'm on, there is a scene where I'm going to start. Uh, this is, takes place in the Pacific Ocean in the states of Oaxaca and Guerrero. And uh, there used to be a very important uh, fortress, military fortress from the Spaniards before the independence in the uh, Fuerte San Diego in Acapulco, close by, uh, a big city, a port city. And uh, one time, this town in particular that you saw some of the images, it's called Coajiniquilapa. And one time in those days, a Frenchman came in a horse with some leather satchels. And, in, 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 and he uh, called all the notables, all the important people in, in Coaji. And uh, he gathered them, assembled them, and he got out of the leather satchel a document and said he wanted to share a very important document with everybody. And uh, the document happened to be the French Constitution. And so the people in Coaginiculapa, there is a museum now there, uh, were particularly interested in one word. And that word was freedom from liberté, égalité, fraternité. So uh, to, 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 to thank Mireille for her beautiful, important reminder of Franz Fanon and, and uh, and uh, all the talk that is so important about decolonization, I tend to disagree. Uh, in that case, vive la France, and vive those three words, which, by the way, uh, pertain to all of us, uh, because those words continue to be important to all of us, all over the world. So, having said that, um, I was asked by Lao Kim Chi to uh, come. Uh, we met in Brazil in the World Social Forum, and she said, we want you to come and talk about your life. I said, why me? I'm always behind the cameras. You know, I don't usually are in front of cameras. But anyway, so the story is that um, indeed, I've been very privileged to have a, an important life. And uh, everything that the presenter said today, uh, the doctors, the professors today, um, really hit my heart. That's because when I was six years old, um, my father was a neurologist in Mexico, and he was invited by Che Guevara to come to Cuba in 61, I was six years old, to uh, build a neurological institute in Havana. And so we moved uh, from Mexico to Cuba, and I was raised there for seven years. And I went to school with uh, Che Guevara's daughter, Hilda. Every day we would walk from the school in 40th Street, 5th Avenue, and uh, I was there uh, when, uh, well, the first time I really met Che was on Ildita's birthday in her house. She lived in the same street as I did, 18th Street in Miramar, a former rich um, neighborhood that was nationalized, where technicians lived and also becados, people from the countryside that came to Havana to study. So. Uh, there were eight tables in the garden, um, Coca-Cola tables, by the way. I remember like photographic memory. And uh, there were chess sets. And Che played with all of us, simultaneous chess, and he won. But anyway, that was a, a memory that I cherish of him. And then I was also there with my parents. Uh, we went to the Karl Marx Theater when Fidel read the letter of goodbye from Che. We were all crying and then uh, he, he went to the revolution in Bolivia. So uh, Cuba was an incredible injection of life, I have to say. I saw 
in the corner of my house in Fifth Avenue, I saw Yuri Gagarin, Valentina Tereshkova, and uh, so many other people that by the age of 10 or so, I knew about Milai, I knew about Selma, Alabama, I knew about Ho Chi Minh, I knew about Mao, I knew about all the world, you know, even if I was 10. And uh, I, of course, read since very early on uh, uh, many books that uh, we all should have read when we were kids or maybe Western people, uh, as Mireille would say, uh, like Moby Dick or like, uh, you know, all the, the, the books, uh, um, Edgar Allan Poe also and Huckleberry Finn and, and so many books that were seminal uh, in terms of founding foundation for knowing about the world. I remember, of course, was San Martín, La Edad de Oro, which was fundamental as a book to understand the Anamites and China and the rest of the world in many ways. It's a book about different, uh, it's for children book by the Cuban prosser, independence prosser, poet, Jose Martí, which by the way, we also had uh, tributaries like you have here for Buddhas, we had for Martí. They were called Rincón Martianos. And uh, we also had, in, in other words, we had a complete free uh, childhood uh, without uh, no worries except the American bombs and uh, that we had. But uh, other than that, we could um, uh, swim in the sea, open sea, and we did every day with my friends. And my friends were from all over the world. And uh, there was a point in my growing up, I remember very distinctly when there was the um, split of the um, uh, peaceful coexistence was called right, Nikrita Khrushchev. And then many Latin Americans, and that's why this is so important for me being here, uh, my parents including, uh, the friends of my parents from other countries like El Salvador, Roque Dalton, uh, who came to the house to drink tequila and sing Mexican songs, you know, but we all, these parents of mine and him and many others were split because uh, all country realities were more rural than, 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 than Soviet Union. So we, they took a, a stand and instead of going with the Soviet Union, they went with China. So uh, as a result of that is how we I guess we decided I was 12 years old. We came back to Mexico in 67. And uh, basically we came organized to make a revolution, an armed revolution, uh, my parents. And uh, the leader in the case of Mexico was named Victor Rico Galán. And just two weeks after we came to Mexico, they were all arrested, except my parents and other people that didn't made it in time to the meeting and uh, and so that was the end of that process and then 68 came and then so after Cuba I guess um, I started very early like at 14 years old or 15. I, I, I went to a Republican school uh, from Spain from exiled Spain people in Mexico who were very important in the development of intellectuality of Mexico, modern Mexico, like founders of the Colegio de Mexico and uh, ma major printing houses like uh, Siglo XXI, like ERA, and uh, they were Spanish Republicans that Mexican President Cárdenas had welcomed to Mexico. And so I went to this school, Colegio Madrid, and uh, very early on, like 13 or so, we founded a, in 68 movement, we founded a mini brigade Karl Marx. And uh, we went to the student movement and uh, I lost my, my fear of talking in public because they would send us in the buses to collect money for the student movement. And we slept in the university, even if we were not a university student, we were kids. And then, so that shaped me a lot and then, Later on, I started to, um, uh, through my father, he gave me my first camera, and I started to take photographs. And um, this instrument has been then with me since then, and uh, it's been an honor because 
I understand that people uh, like to be photographed like we all saw today and yesterday, but also because they want to uh, sort of document their place in history. And so with this camera, I've gone from uh, Mexico in a, we later on took a uh, take over a, a, a theater center in Mexico that only show uh, Shakespeare plays. And uh, the students, uh, young students, drama students, they were wanting to uh, show uh, contestatory plays. They wanted to show a play by Peter Weiss called the Fantoche Lusitano. It's a play about Portugal and about um, dictatorships. And uh, applied to Mexico, the director was a Brazilian uh, director named Augusto Boal. So we took the theater and uh, we created this movement called, or this center called Tleta, which is a, a center for um, experiment, uh, theater experimentation, free center for theater experimentation. So we took that play from Mexico and we went with all the actors uh, hitchhiking from Mexico all the way to Argentina for one year and a half. So it was an incredible trip by land and uh, everywhere we were, uh, people really uh, reacted to this uh, play. And also we also had movies. Uh, my first movie was about a strike of women, uh, textile women in my state, which is uh, Morelos. And, uh, and so the movie also became like a passport everywhere we were, even if we look hippie and uh, long hair, and the workers were a little skeptical because we didn't fit the profile of being like serious. But once they saw the movie about the workers, and these were 320 women uh, textile workers that, that um, uh, won the strike and became the first independent union um, against, I mean, uh, not PRI, not government control, and they were reinstituted in their job, so it had a happy end in the movie. That was a struggle. They, they were fired, and then they took the main plaza in Cuernavaca for a month uh, with children and grandmothers and tamales and everything. And the governor could not come out, and the 15th September we have the independence, and governors come out, president, and they say, long live Mexico, and balcony, but with all these women, they couldn't do that. So he had to negotiate, and that's how it happened. So because he had a happy ending, it was pretty moving. And that was a passport. Everywhere we were in Latin America, uh, the workers came to see the movie after the leaders saw it. And uh, we had 2,000, 3,000 people looking at the movies. And after that, we always had a house, and they always welcomed us. And they also took us to uh, film uh, different struggles, like in Guatemala, we film about military dictatorship and cooperatives. Then in Nicaragua, we filmed about earthquake survivors. And then in Panama, we filmed about uh, Omar Torrijos and the fight for the recuperation of the Panama Canal. And we went to all the garrisons in Panama with the Guardia Nacional Panameña to show the movie and the play. And in Colombia, we filmed about uh, the first um, uh, peasant union uh, that happened in Los Llanos Orientales, Aravena, with the Anuk. And then we filmed about the indigenous people in, in Crica, in El Cauca. And uh, sometimes we were put in jail, and, and we were usually supported by Mexican uh, embassies because in those days we had a sort of uh, uh, demo not democratic, but a wannabe democratic president named Echeverria, who happened to be also later we knew a CIA agent and uh, responsible for the 68 massacre. But in terms of foreign policy, they were pretty liberal. The Mexican diplomacy was pretty liberal, and uh, so they always defended us. So in, like in Colombia, they put us in jail, and the ambassador came and got us out and, and negotiated with the Colombian government 
instead of deporting us back to Mexico to take us to the frontier with Ecuador. So we keep, keep on going. And um, in Peru, we filmed about the um, um, revolution of the generals Velasco Alvarado. And, and, uh, and then in Bolivia, we made a film about the miners, about death in the mines. And uh, in Argentina, we filmed about um, the death of Perón and uh, the, the revolt uh, against the anger of the young people against uh, official Perón. And there was a split between the young workers of Peronista workers and then the, the establishment um, official Peronistas, you know. And so, um, always with the camera, we made films about this. We were part of this. Uh, cooperative in Mexico called Cooperativa de Cine Marginal, um, which um, some people might know, Paco Ignacio Taibo was part of it, and we were part of it. It was a cooperative that believed that cinema should be used as a tool for organizing. And uh, we made films about workers and showed them to workers and so on and so And then I came back and uh, continued with that, I guess, tradition. Um, my mom used to work in, with a, a man named Ivan Illich in, in a center in Cuernavaca that was a, a center for thought, uh, for documentation. He was a radical priest that believed that missionaries from the Vatican sent to Latin America should know the history of Latin America well, and not only Spanish, but the language, but also the realities. And so my mother um, taught in this center uh, about Cuban Revolution and about Mexican Revolution. And uh, she sent me with some of her students that came to Cuernavaca to learn Spanish to New York. Five minutes? Three, Three minutes. minutes. So I was there with the Young Lords, and, uh, and that was an interesting one year. I learned English there. And also was in California with the Seven of La Raza. And, uh, and then later on, um, when I was in first year of film school, um, I went to Nicaragua uh, in 1978. And uh, I stayed there for four years. And uh, I documented the Sandinista Revolution. And then, uh, as that, as part of the life. Thank you. Uh, after all, <coughs> I would like to say thank you, organizer of this uh, this conference for me is a very nice opportunity to to share, uh, also to to learn about experience, all the experience. Uh, also, uh, I thank you for you for being here to to share with us about our experience. So I the history of. Cuban Revolution is well known. Uh, from two, um, 1959, when revolution, revolution Trump, and then all period of the, as the uh, um, 1965, when it's was clear the socialist path of Cuban Revolution. But I, would, I don't like it. I, don't, and I would know to talk about this period. I, will, and I want to talk about period from 1919. This period is, uh, is very well known as the crisis period. But this, uh, this period uh, show what is the complexity, what is the complexity of the Cuban Revolution because at this time, everybody know, was the collapse of Soviet Union. The collapse of Soviet Union represents a very uh, starting point, even it's not a uh, favorable condition, but it's open very nice opportunity to 
the innovative experience of the Cuban Revolution and the potentiality of Cuban Revolution. So I would like to show maybe this environment with this four picture, uh, give it idea how people respond to the crisis because you can imagine 90% of the import at, at export uh, was uh, under dependency of Soviet Union. And then the situation is getting worse because the United States uh, strained the embargo to, to Cuba, 50 year or embargo to Cuba. But this is the situation in the contrast side. Uh, of course, there is a, some point that characterize the, the policy, the state policy, to respond to this situation, to respond to, to this crisis, economic crisis, with no import. Uh, food reduction was very drastic. Uh, it's calculated that the average Cuban lost almost uh, 40 pounds. <laughs> but I think not for this. Yeah, this is for only because I, this is my genetic uh, constitution. No? But this is the, the most important. The state decentralized the tenure of the land. At that point, 80%. 85% of the land was in the hand of the state. Uh, the state decided to decentralize the lands. Because it's true that uh, there is no resources to maintain the monoculture. There is no resources to maintain the sugar industry, because this is a, the, the mo most important for us is the sugar in industry at that time. And then the policy of decentralization of the, the land tenure, decentralization of the market, decentralization of the making power decision, and it was centralized, and it's localized. And also, there is some a new perspective of distribution. Because uh, uh, in Cuba, the distribution is a. Uh, from 60, there is a rational distribution, uh, food distribution. So we have a rational car. If we receive something stable food for everybody, subsidiary food, I mean education free, uh, health, public health free. And the only important change is uh, that the guidelines, the technological guidelines is the agriculture was established sustainable development everywhere. In the suburban agriculture, urban agriculture, in most of the, this, uh, this program make it the, uh, Cuba very, like uh, in U UN said, very ecological ecological country. Uh, Q1 is you take the two the two indicator, uh, the food sprint and the human development index, Q1 was the first in the world. It's in 2006 for this. Uh, so I would like to emphasize some res resort of this policy. You can see the centralization 60% of the land. Now, even uh, there is a several decree law. And then uh, everybody that can to, to plant, to produce food, they stay, give it in use of fruit, land. You can see. Uh, uh, open. That is a, a, another uh, another point of this policy. There is, a, for example, you can receive uh, now in this 20 years you can use uh, this land 
Only you have to produce organically. You have to produce sustainable. Like, you have to uh, negotiate with the state, the production. There is a, some challenge because still is something centralized mind. Uh, but it's, uh, I think this is a, a good starting point. Another res result, very interesting, is that the, because this sector, for this uh, uh, transformation of tenor of the land, for this transformation, Cuba now uh, stay, uh, is uh, in the st state land, is less land than the, the cooperative sector. That's why cooperative sector is the main. They produce this, we call, sometimes we call private cooperative sector, but it's, co it's cooperative sector with the worker that uh, build cooperative and also private. And then you can see this, for me, this is more important. Uh, the, the, pro, the productive performance of this sector. With a small piece of land, they produce more of the food in the country. This is one lending that uh, every day we, we receive in, in Cuba. So we, we publish this true book because one book, we, this I, I, I can send to to organizator of the, because we try to, uh, uh, we have a picture about how, how is, uh, what is the performance of this uh, agriculture in Cuba. And now because the state try to introduce GM food, so we, something not agree with this policy and then we publish this, this book. Uh, try to advise the government not to do this. So this is the program of the urban agriculture. You can see in the, in the city. By the way, Q1, um, the vegetable, we consume 80% of the vegetable is for this program. So this program uh, show that have the potentiality. And of course, now is a, a lot of discussion about rational cut. Is it rational cut is a suitable or no? Uh, Raul Castro announced that would be abolished. And then there is what subsidized person and no food. Because before, for example, I received I receive a, a cigarette, tobacco, but I don't, I don't smoke. But there is equality or egalitarianism. The food system is cost to the country a lot, so it's, it's, it's not sustainable. Now we have a new scenario. How many do I have? Um, you're, you're fine. Ah, uh, we have a new scenario. Now we have a normalization, Cuba, uh, US. But why I present this? Because uh, we have a lot of discussion because we in the 19, the organic agriculture show potentiality to feed the country. Is the, there is a good policy, there is land, there is a resource, there is a political will. Cuban people is very organized in this sense. Cuban people is knowledgeable because we have education. You go to Cuba, Cuba, we, we, we have a very bad uh, mind because we, we think that we know everything. If you ask Cuba, you know something, we say, we know. If we don't know, we know people that know. So we have this, uh, but this is potentiality because thanks to this, we can in the night respond to the crisis. But now, the discussion is when, when we have a Venezuelan uh, support, very good support in the 2003-2004, the state want to back to the Green Revolution. 
more fertilizer, more pesticide, more uh, monoculture. And then, not Venezuela, but there is the possibility. With United States, United States also want to take advantage of this. You can see, for example, there is two commissions this uh, in 2017, in 2018, uh, two commissions come, one from the trade agribusiness and one from the organic, because both show the possibility to do agrobusiness with Cuba. And then in Cuba, there is polarized, polarized uh, opinion. Because, some, for example, I think that this way, this fair way, is not suitable for us. Uh, this way is for it or for, uh, suitable for us, but without this kind of transnational approach. But we don't know what, what politician, or what uh, official, they, maybe they know better situation than us. There is also urgency, and then I don't know if it, there is a challenge. If you go to Cuba, if you study the Cuban reality, you, you can follow how to, you see, we decide this or we decide this. This, uh, uh, this approach. So to finish, we have another scenario. scenario. Another scenario is the triumph promised to abolish the, the Obama normalization relation with, with, with Cuba. There is also polarized opinion because some, somebody said the, the Obama policy opened uh, United States market to Cuba is practically uh, to kill Cuban revolution because even this open uh, purpose. Trump said no way, but somebody, some academic, said Trump is good because obligate Cuba to to search to to looking for the sustainability, to looking for, for uh, take advantage of the, 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 resource, the resource that Cuban revolution uh, achieved in, the, in these days. Of course, it, we have, this is the question that I, I, I give it to you because uh, now Triumph, because Triumph see what is the problem with competitive, Trump want to something restablish some achievement of the Obama. So uh, thank you very much. This is my presentation. Hello. So first, uh, my name is Ana Ana Saldanha. I'm an associate professor at the Macau Polytechnic Institute. I apologize myself for my terrible English, but I'll do my best. So I'm here to talk about the Brazilian and the Colombian agrarian question, and I will start with the Brazilian one. So the general objectives is to understand how the industrial capitalism, then financial one, has ch changed the production relations in the countryside. It means the production relations between individuals in productive activity, uh, which is marked, I'm following Marx, as you noted, uh, which is marked by the forms of appropriation of the means of production. I don't know how to pass the slide. Where, how do I do? How do I pass the slide? Here. Okay. Okay. So, uh, all the production relations are the socio-economical structure of society. It means it's the basis through which legal and political foundations are created. So, and they are materialized in clear differences in the social conditions of life of individuals, uh, which has as consequence the development of strong contradictions in, uh, between those who own the means of production and those who don't own it. In this sense, inequality and exploration oblige small farmers with land farmers without land and agriculture workers 
uh, to a situation of dependency, dependency on favorable climateric conditions to the agriculture production, uh, dependence on the sale of products they produced to a price that optimizes the added value of big farm owners and dependent on the work sell. So uh, the productive forces and the production relations are strictly connected with the mode of production. The Portuguese arrived in Brazil in 500. In 532, the land was divided in 15 hereditary captaincies to populate the country and develop the cultivation of sugarcane, which was one of the most important products in the international market at the time. So the captaincies were donated to Portuguese people who would go to Brazil and invest their own money in the land. We can uh, consider, consider that the actual structure of the distribution in land in Brazil has its basis on this first distribution of land that the Portuguese made on the 16th century. Uh, after this failed attempt to establish this kind of hereditary captaincies, the Portuguese crown established the gov general government. This was a form of centralization and control by Portuguese royal power. Since neither silver or gold were found like the Spanish uh, have found it, the economy in the Brazilian colony was based on agricultural products which were exported to Europe and the sugarcane was introduced. Through this system of implantation, lands were given to colonizers who were expected to use a large number of slaves to produce merchandise to the colonial markets. A restricted society was then created for the majority in which the ownership of the land was held by few landowners, making it impossible for poor people to have access to land for cultivation. So, in Brazil, the colonization served the interests of the Portuguese crown and its aristocratic mercantile stratum. It means the colonization is thus carried out through the large slave owning monoculture property with the production aimed at export to Portugal. So, Brazil is independent in 1822 and in 1850 the Brazilian empire, strongly dependent on British capital, and preparing for the end of slavery, decides to promulgate a land law. This law has emerged as a legal framework for adequacy of the economic system and preparation for the crisis of slave labor. So, since 1850, the land ceases from then on to constitute a good of nature to become a commodity and the possibility of acquire land by the most disadvantaged classes, including those working in the countryside, was permanently banned, while the preservation of the Brazilian land structure was perpetuated. In 1888, the slavery w uh, is definitively ended, but it did not resolve the situation of the slaves. Complementary laws proposed by abolitionists were never signed. And in 1889, the Republic is proclaimed in Brazil. Domination of Brazil between 1889 and 1930 is made by the landed gentry of São Paulo, dominated by the coffee industry, and Minas Gerais, dominated by dairy interests. We call this period the Coffee with Milk Republic. So, it is when Sao Paulo will become the paradigm of the capitalist agriculture model. In the late 20s, the coffee represented 72% of all the Brazilian exportations. With the abolition of slavery, the Republic sought to substitute slaves for European immigrants especially in places where the expansion of exportation products was taking place. That left black people and mulatos, the ex-slaves, to work in a system of partnership or to develop subsistent farming for the big landowners. The enormous amount of Brazilian territory, together with the small concentration of the population, contributed to the rise of the great landowners 
who expanded their domi uh, domains by forcing the, se the sale of small properties. So, and once more, the Republic delayed the agrarian reforms that since, uh, since the beginning of the, uh, since the end of the 19th century had been proposed by different political groups. So, uprisings were always violently quashed by governments tied to dominant groups. But in 1930, a new government will contribute to breaking the dominant system of the oligarchs. In 1930, in order to impose an economic model based on greater industrialization, the industrial bourgeoisie removes from power the agro-export rural er oligarchy. Under the political leadership of uh, Getulio Vargas, industry will subordinate agriculture and the city will hegemonize rural areas. So a new model of dependency will be maintained this time through industrialization. It is also between the 30s and the 40s that Brazil will, uh, uh, will suffer with the uh, industrial capitalist accumulation. Foreign trade contracting following the crack of 1929 was partially controlled by the purchase of coffee stocks by the government. It is when uh, appear the first import difficulties. At the same time, these import difficulties have stimulated industrial investments and the economy was then sustained through these industrial investments. Uh, we have to say that industrially will gradually take on the role of leader in all this process and the domestic market become more attractive than the external one. A new constitution is approved in 1934. It brought some advances, for example, the guarantee of land repossession for public need or use. But it did not, however, produce the intended effects and it was replaced by a more conservative constitution of, in 1937, directed more towards urban issues than the agriculture sector. So, also political power in the 30s and in the 40s is held by a new elite uh, who owns the industry, land ownership does not change ends. So, the traditional rural oligarchy still wants to own its vast agricultural properties and to produce for exports. We do see a necessary conciliation of interests that will be materialized in a class pact between the industrial bourgeoisie and the rural oligarchy, both working for the implementation of a dependent industrial model. In this way, dependent capitalism is deepened, linked to a, the development of a new industrial sector, agro or agri-industry. These contradictions that, uh, the contradictions that were created by capitalist accumulation, we can see them through literature and, art, and arts. Here we have an example of some paintings of a Brazilian painter, painter Candido Portinari, that uh, represented how it was to live in the countryside in Brazil during the 30s and the 40s. If the beginning of industrial development is favored by the crisis of the industrialized economies in the 30s and the Second World War, this context changes as far uh, as changes from 45 when international competition increases. So in the 50s, uh, we will see extremely favorable me measures to foreign capital it is when the great modernization of agriculture takes place. But at the same time, we will see a big degree of monopoly in Brazili Brazilian industry, which was reinforced by direct foreign investments. So we, it will be created an oligopoly structure and we will see once more the concentration of capital. From the 60s, the demographic development, the capitalist penetration of the countryside, and the rising of land prices 
will end the Brazilian relative abundance of land. This situation will lead to the emergence of landless settle settlers or settlers with insufficient land to support the family nucleus. That's why in the 60s, Rio Grande do Sul is confronted with a situation of almost 30,000 families demanding land. And that's why also in 1984, the uh, MST, the work, Landless Workers Movement, will be born precisely in Rio Grande do Sul. So this decade will see the birth of the first landless peasants movement whose method of struggle goes through the occupation of land. With the rise of the peasant leagues and rural unions, the peasant movement was organized gradually into a legal struggle. Opinion in favor of agrarian reform grew, grew as a way to change the land ownership system. And the movement radicalized through strikes and evasions of disused properties. So the seri seriousness of the situation caused society to be more concerned with the issue and to discuss it. In 63, rural worker statute guaranteed for field workers the right to a minimum wage and other rights. But in March 31, 1964, there's a military coup in Brazil with the support of the United States of America. It only ended in 1985. The military coup of 1964 will stop the rise of the struggle for land. In addition to violently repressing the movements of landless peasants who were putting pressure on the state, the military dictatorship sought to direct that working mass, it means the landless peasants, to Amazonia. In this context, that uh, the dictatorship itself promulgates the land statue. The objective was to coloni colonize the territory and was the displacement of rural populations to depopulated areas. Like it happened in Mexico, for example, in the beginning of the 20th century. The military dictatorship developed a moderate project of agrarian reform, but studies that were conducted, conducted in 1967, 1972, and 1976 showed a complete dominance of the huge properties in Brazilian territory that were not properly cultivated. The small properties even through a large number, occupied smaller areas and were responsible for the majority of food production in Brazil. The result of the agrarian policies of the military regime reinforced the power of traditional large property owners and developed the modern landlord system of large national and multinational companies. Agriculture projects Agro-industrials and cattle farmers, financed by the government, were transformed into enormous property owners taking possession of the lands of unauthorized settlers and Indians. There were incentives for developing imported agriculture technology with the growth in the production of raw materials and food. At present, and globally, Agriculture is dominated by financial capital, now interna internationalized. Sorry for my English. However, in a financial no economy, agriculture suffers from the imposition of transgenic seeds, most of which are destined to the cultivation of soybeans, maize, cotton, which are not an economic necessity, but rather represent a response to the need of the market and exponential productivity. This transgenic technology was developed mainly from the 90s with the central objective of implementing private seed ownership. It means if industrial capitalism turned land into commodity, financial capitalism in the 20th century has transformed the seeds in merchandise. In order to enable this tra transformation of a, of a property from nature into private property, norms ruled by patent laws 
for living beings were introduced. The seeds can now be handled in laboratory and be patented, obliging the farmer who wants to use them to pay royalties. In this context, the market for pesticides is being developed in order to adapt a specific transgenic seed to a precise agrochemical. This patenting of seeds and consequent mercantilization of natural goods constitutes a process of accumulation of capital which, is par uh, which is, uh, happens at the same time than the culture of monoculture. In the 20th century, monoculture has also established a novelty. It means with the introduction of agrofuel on a large scale, which produces crops for fuel and not for food production. After, first, the mercantilization of the land, then of the seeds, capitalism, in order not to allow its profit rate to be lowered, seeks to impose private ownership of all natural resources. The water is an example. According to Marx, in industrial capitalism, the sum of constant capital, variable capital, and surplus value resu results in the value, it means the price of a product. According to him, taking into account the cap competition among, among the companies, the capitalists could not exaggerate to match the desired profit rate. In the case of natural resources, given their finitude, their market price will always be higher than their value. In this sense, the private appropriation of natural resources allows the obtaining of very high profits when compared with those that can be obtained through the industrial activity or the mining agriculture activity. All this evolution that has been taking place within the capitalist mode of production has created a new paradigm of production whose, uh, which maximum exponent is represented by agrobusiness. So the main vindication of rural workers has been agrarian reform. But the land statute was never truly applied, and the existing structures and political power maintained by the large land owners and company has always, uh, have always resisted and impeded this change. I don't know if I have time because this was about Brazil. I should talk about Colombia, but I don't know if I have time. Okay, yeah, I, will be, I, I will try to be very quick. So, about Colombia uh, agrarian question. The Colombian history has been always been connected with the agrarian question. And through, the, through its history, the resistance movements of the Colombian people against exploitation of the big land owners and the, against the capitalist agriculture model more recently was always been a fight. And the Colombian oligarchy response was always through terror and violence. Since the uh, 2000s that the oil reserves have increased and that the extraction of natural resources constitutes the bulk of the country's exports. 41% nowadays of total exports in Colombia are of oil and coal. From 1886 to 1930, uh, an example, uh, Colombia, Colombia was uh, submitted to the North American interests. An example of the economical and political submission of the Colombian state to the United States is the banana industry, mostly through the United Fruit Company. We are in the early 20th century, the one that Theodore Roosevelt had proclaimed as the American century. Between 1900 and 1930, the exploitation of oil, horse, railways, ports, roads, and major public works were under control of a few businessmen based in Pittsburgh, New York, Philadelphia, and other cities of the United States. In 1931, with a liberal president, it is signed with the United States the Show Folsom contract. Even if it is a liberal, this contract, this contract the, uh, delivers 
uh, the hydrocarbons of Catatumbo in the hands of the United States. It is written on this contract that the Colombian government will lend to the contracting companies the right protection to prevent or repeal the hostility or attacks of Motilon Bari tribes or other savages who live in the regions which lands are part of this contract. The US monopolies present in Colombia are, for example, the Stardust Oil of New Jersey, today Exxon, or the Gulf Oil Corporation. In this situation, the struggle for land will be stronger and stronger, and uh, in between 1936 and 1938, the president of, uh, uh, of the republic will, uh, will approve an agrarian reform, which was intended to distribute within 10 years unproductive land to landless peasants. But in 38, the next president, Eduardo Santos, it was the great uncle of the current president of the Republic, and López Pumarejo, that it was the one who had approved the agrarian reform in 38, both will curb the reforms, especially the agrarian reform. So it is by the end of the same president that has uh, approved the first agrarian reform uh, reform that a process of deceleration of the reforms is promoted and in 1944 a process of counter reform of the law of agrarian reform is will take place. This law of 1944 will extend for 10 more years the attribution of unproductive lands to small peasants thus post Poning the first attempt to implement a, a, a really uh, an agrarian reform and new violent clashes between peasants, peasantry and land owners will emerge. From 1946 on, great massacres were perpetrated against peasants and native communities fighting for land. The conflict intensifies and the powerful landowners increasingly used arms to subjugate the peasantry and native communities. It is during this period that will appear the first paramilitary armies and the, uh, the f that uh, will always... Uh, I don't know how to say it in English. Uh, I will pass. So, uh, from 1940. Uh, eight, uh, from 1948 starts the period known as Great Violence, which coincides with the formation of the guerrillas. And very important in this year, on April 9, the presidential candidate of Liberal Party, Jorge Eliezer Gaetan, is assassinated. And there are several armed uprisings. Gradually, self-defense groups that had formed after the assassination of the candidate will improve operational and organizational plans and will become gradually guerrillas. The army, the army immerses itself in the class conflicts in order to protect the landowners. Between 1953 and 1957, the American and Colombian oligarchy, in order to fight the guerrillas, imposes a military dictatorship. And in 58, in order to overcome the partisan violence that they themselves fostered, it established a political settlement of governmental alternation between the Conservative Party and the Liberal Party. In 1958, in Mercitalia, a group of guerrillas decides to demobilize the armed body and to constitute self-defense groups constituted by peasants. It is the agrarian movement of Mercitalia. In 1961, as a result of peasant convergence and mobilization, an agrarian reform, the second one, is approved. Despite this law, the government pressure on the peasantry increases. In 1962, a conservative congressman claims that some regions in Colombia 
are escaping to national sovereignty. So the government will start a uh, campaign against the settlement of the ex-guerrillas of the agrarian movement of Mercatalia. The first combat against the agrarian movement of Mercatalia takes place on May 27, 1964. This is the date that marks the creation of the guerrilla FARC-EP. Uh, the agrarian program of the guerrilla said we fight for an agrarian policy that gives the land of the latifundio to the peasants. That is why from today, July 20, 64, we are a guerrilla army that fights for the following agrarian program. We oppose an effective revolutionary agrarian policy that changes the social structure of the Colombian countryside. This this armed conflict that began in 64 will, uh, would only end with, with the signature of the peace agreement in 2016. Another guerrilla appears in 1965 and it, always, it, uh, it makes public its uh, manifesto, its program. And they also say that an authentic agrarian revolution that contemplates the elimination of latifundio, of minifundio and of monoculture is necessary. In the 60s and the 60s, in rural territory, increases the importance of land ownership and the importance of expanding the agriculture frontier. And on the 17th begins also the cocaine production and the first cartel, the first Colombian cartel is born. I think we all know the cartel of Pablo Escobar. So, and the agrarian conflict will thereafter meet a new element, the drug trafficking. In the 60s and the, in the 70s, we will also see a privatization of productive public sectors. So the state began the process of privatization of Ecopatrol and other contracts were legitima legitimized through taxes and royalties and allowed the exploitation of the resources until exhausted, exhaust, exhaustion. The privatization process continued in the 90s with the sale of assets such as refineries and oil pipelines. In 1994, a new neoliberal agrarian reform was passed, promoted by the World Bank. It establishes a national system of agrarian reform and it also establishes, this is more, very important in Colombia, in today's Colombia, the peasant reserve zones which the peasants will use to try to curb the dominance of large property, the occupation of land by monopolies and transnationals, and the intensive use of monoculture. During his term office, the president, Alvaro Uribe, will intensify the process of land accumulation. Under the presidency of Uribe, his uh, agrarian program was, uh, an agrarian program was implemented which is presented as a system of agriculture subsidies that should benefit small Colombian farmers. In practice, the money that should have been given to peasants and small farmers were diverted to paramilitarism, to the Colombian land-owning oligarchy and to multinationals and transnationals operating in Colombia. Juan Manuel Santos, former Minister of Defense of Uribe, elected president in 2010 and in 2014, apparently impel, impelled a policy of redistribu redistribution sorry, of land, but it was also a failure. Um, Santos had promised to redistribute land to 100, uh, 160,000 families displaced by violence However, only 431 families were redeployed. So, to, in conclusion, the Colombian rural structure is characterized by a high concentration of land ownership. 
the United States imperialism has imposed itself on the region since the late 19th century. Today, the United States control and dominate the extraction of natural resources, especially oil. Since the late 90s, 48% of total Colombian exports are directed to the United States. And 42% of imports come from the United States. The economic relationship of dependence was reinforced with the increase of Colombian oil production in the late 90s. Today, 80% of this production is directly sent to the United States. Since the agrarian question arises from the structural contradiction of the mode of socio-economic organization, which produces concentration of wealth and the consequent expansion of poverty and misery, the resolution of the oldest armed clone conflict in the American continent was dependent on the resolution of land conflicts. Since the agrarian reform of 1961 was never materialized, the current process of agrarian counter-reform continues through the use of arms, money, intimidation of the peasant and native movement, the promotion, the promotion of subsidies for agribusiness and powerful landowners. It should be noted that Colombia imports more than 8 million tons of food per year and delivers the most fertile land to the production of raw materials for exports at low cost. And that's all. Thank you very much and sorry.